The ratings are in for Friday's edition of AEW Collision that went head-to-head -head with WWE's Friday Night Smackdown, the final episode on Fox before the move to USA Network this week, as well as the ratings for AEW Rampage that aired directly after AEW Collision. Monday Night Raw will be returning to a two-hour format for the last three months of 2024 before the move to Netflix next year. CM Punk vs. Drew McIntyre is now official for WWE Bad Blood inside a hell in a cell. Jey Uso is number one contender for the WWE. WWE Intercontinental Championship. Bret Hart calls Gunther a coward for refusing Sami Zayn a World Heavyweight Championship opportunity. Rhea Ripley versus Liv Morgan for the Women's World Championship as well, as Finn Balor versus Damian Priest is confirmed for Bad Blood. Natalia returns to Monday Night Raw last night and picks up the victory for her team. Bianca Belair and Jade Cargo retain the Women's Tag Team Championships. The Wyatt Six defeat American Maid in a brutal street fight to open the show. AEW star Roosh posts a photo of himself beneath the Fox Sports logo amid media deal rumors. Plus, we have internal reactions from WWE for the upcoming Vince McMahon Netflix docuseries. Hey guys, welcome back to Rest News 365. Hope everyone is doing very well. As always, there are plenty of news stories to get into in the world of professional wrestling. Let's begin with a lot of ratings from Friday night. There was a lot of pro wrestling on Friday. Let's begin with AEW Collision that aired outside of its usual Saturday night time slot due to AEW All Out taking place on Saturday. Now, September 6th on TNT was dominated by AEW programming as the company gave their fans one last burst of action before the All Out pay-per-view on September 6th. 7th. A preempted episode of AEW Collision was followed by AEW Rampage, followed by an all-out countdown show. How many people tuned into Collision to watch Kazuchika Okada's opponents for All Out be decided? Hikaru Shida versus Diana Perazzo and the eight-man match of champions. Well, according to WrestleNomics, Collision averaged a total of 157,000 viewers, making it the lowest viewed episode of Collision since the show began back in June of 2023. The 157,000 viewers also mark a staggering 46% drop from the 289,000 viewers the August 31st episode garnered, a show that aired in its normal time slot but had to contend with WWE's Bash in Berlin Premium Lab event taking place on the same day but not at the same time. The key 18 to 49 demographic number also took a large hit as the show earned a 0.04 number, another record low for collision, and a steep 60% drop from the 0.10 number earned the previous week. Now, now, the decline in viewership and ratings could mostly be attributed to the show going head-to-head -head with the final episode of WWE SmackDown on Fox, which we'll talk about in just a second. It also went head-to-head -head against the NFL game between the Green Bay Packers and Philadelphia Eagles that aired live from Sao Paulo, Brazil on Peacock, which earned a total of 14 million viewers. Now, according to Programming Insider, Collision placed 22nd for the evening amongst all primetime shows that aired on cable, 15 spots behind AEW Rampage, in seventh. Uh, we'll get to those ratings in just a second as well. But first, let's talk about the competition that was head-to-head, -head, that being Friday Night Smackdown. Of course, it was the final episode of Smackdown to air on Fox before the move to USA Network as part of WWE Week that begins on Friday. Now, of course, WWE Week actually started last night with Monday Night Raw, but the first Smackdown episode on USA Network, Friday Night Smackdown, since it returned after departing back in 2019, will be this coming Friday. But the September 6th episode of Smackdown marked an end of an era for WWE's blue brand as the show not only saw the fallout from the bash in Berlin premium live event on August 31st but also marked the final episode on Fox ahead of the move back to USA Network on September 13th. While the fans in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada saw the action unfold live, how many people tuned into Fox one final time? Well, according to WrestleNomics, the show averaged a total of 1.770 million viewers, a record low for SmackDown in its five-year run on Fox when it comes to a live broadcast. The only episode in the show's history that averaged a lower total while on Fox was the December 29, 2023 episode that showed re-aired footage from the previous 12-month period. Compared to the August 30th show that took place in Germany, the September 6th episode saw a 14% drop in average viewership. 
The same record low happened in the key 18 to 49 demographic as well, as the show earned a 0.45 number, a 15% drop from the previous week, and a number that is only beaten by the aforementioned December 29th, 2023 episode in terms of low numbers. Now, despite this, SmackDown earned the top spot among the 18 to 49 audience for the night's primetime TV shows, according to Programming Insider. However, the show placed second for the night when the NFL game that aired on Peacock was included that earned 14 million viewers. Now what about AW Rampage? As I mentioned, AW Rampage aired after AW Collision on the same network though on TNT and in terms of the numbers it was some better news when it comes to recent Rampage demographics. Now AW Rampage's ratings and audience were on Friday, of course as I mentioned with Collision as the lead-in. Friday's episode brought in a 0.08 rating in the 18-49 demographic and 233,000 viewers per WrestleNomics. Now, those numbers are up 14.3% and 6.9% from the previous week's 0.07 demo rating and the audience of 218,000. Now, the show's demo rating and audience were still below the 0.10 demo rating and 290,000 viewers from two weeks ago. Rampage is averaging a 0.108 demo rating and 326,000 viewers in 2024 to date, compared to a 0.120 demo rating and 397,000 viewers for the same point in 2023. Now, let's talk about a big format change when it comes to Monday Night Raw for the remainder of this year and possibly when they move over to Netflix next year. For over a decade, WWE Raw has been a three-hour affair. As the Red Brand's time with the USA Network draws to a close, however, it has been announced that WWE's flagship show will be temporarily reverting to a two-hour weekly schedule. WWE took to X to make the announcement during the season premiere of Raw on Monday night. The reason for the format change was not disclosed. The change is expected to begin on October 7th on that episode of Raw, immediately after WWE's upcoming Bad Blood Premium Live event, and last through the December 30th episode of Raw, which will be the show's final episode on USA Network, before it moves to Netflix in January. During this period, the show will air from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, as pointed out by Fightful Sean Ross Sapp. This means the Monday night 10 p.m. Eastern television block will be free of wrestling programming for the first time in decades, as the previous two-hour format started at 9 p.m. Eastern for much of its run. Whether Netflix will maintain the two-hour runtime or return the show to three hours or implement some other plan is currently unknown. Despite USA Network's recent acquisition of WWE SmackDown, there are no known plans to change the Blue Brand's runtime or that of NXT, of course, which is preparing it for its own move to the CW Network later on this year. Now, as was heavily speculated going into Raw last night, it has now been confirmed we do know what the main event of WWE Bad Blood 2024 is going to be. It's going to be hell in a cell. CM Punk and Drew McIntyre's feud has been Raw's bloodiest, most gruesome spectacle, so it's only fitting that their feud is settled at WWE's upcoming Bad Blood events in one of the more violent match types the company has to offer, Hell in a Sow. Now, McIntyre took to the ring Monday to address a litany of issues. Initially, McIntyre was ready to move past uh, a punk, uh, post-punk world and mentioned an interest in the World Heavyweight Championship. Adam Pearce, though, was not keen to let McIntyre proceed with his career without punishment for the September 2nd assault on punk, which ended with the best in the world being hauled away in an ambulance. Pearce announced that the two superstars will settle their differences in a Hell in a Cell match to be held at Bad Blood on October 5th. The Hell in a Cell match will be the tie-breaking third installment in the Punk and McIntyre historically violent feud. Interestingly, this news comes out nearly three months after Punk's Clash in the Castle press conference appearance where he claimed that he was disinterested in giving matches with McIntyre. He cited his indifference towards the Hell in a Cell match stipulation specifically and claimed he doesn't want to ever do Hell in a Cell. CM Punk has yet to comment on this, although it must be said this was an immediate aftermath saying that their first match would be Hell in a Cell, so maybe he meant to build up to it. We shall wait and see, but the match is now confirmed. Now, Jay Uso is number one contender for the WWE Intercontinental Championship. Monday's edition of Raw, of course, was the season premiere. It had a big fight feel, thanks in no small part to the night's Intercontinental Championship number one contender tournament finals. Main event, Jay Uso, Ilya Dragunov, Pete Dunne, and Braun Strowman competed in a four-way match to determine Braun Breaker's next challenger, but only Uso walked out of Calgary with a title shot. 
Breaker met with each challenger before the night's main event to deliver some choice threats, but every challenger stood strong against the champion's intimidation tactics. Blood was shed over the high-stakes competition, which only began to unravel nearly 30 minutes into the matchup, when Strowman took his strength to the outside with the Strowman Express. After clearing Dunn, Dragunov, and Uso, Strowman found himself near the announce table, where he was ambushed by a returning Big Bronson Reed. Strowman had taken Reed's place in the tournament after the latter was diagnosed with COVID-19, and the tsunami happy superstar was keen on exacting his revenge. Back in the ring, Uso and Dragunov exchanged a series of blows that ended with Uso nailing Dragunov with a spear. Before Uso could capitalize on the pin, Dunn threw him out and attempted to steal the victory for himself. Miraculously, Dragunov kicked out and nearly put Dunn away with an H-bomb before Uso broke up, broke up the pin with a super kick. Uso took to the sky and delivered a signature Uso splash onto Dunn for the victory. Following the match, Breaker appeared in the ring to confront the new number one contender. The two men faced off as the show went off the air. With this victory, Uso, of course, is one step closer to achieving his first singles title with the company. The time and place, though, for this upcoming Intercontinental Championship match has yet to be confirmed. Now, last night, we saw the return of WWE Hall of Famer Brett the Hitman Hart. Now, there were some last-minute reports of ill health, but the Hitman managed to appear on Raw on the season premiere before an adoring Calgary crowd. Hart, known for speaking his mind, took to the microphone in his hometown appearance to criticize WWE World Heavyweight Champion Gunther and defend Canada's own Sami Zayn. After he expressed his gratitude to the Calgary crowd and extended WWE Universe, Hart was interrupted by Gunther. The World Heavyweight Champion poked fun at Hart's legacy, reduced Hart to merely the best there was, and Gunther named himself the best there is and the best there ever will be, and invoked the name of Hart's longtime adversary Bill Goldberg, saying that Hart was his second favorite superstar and Goldberg was his first. Zay made his appearance shortly after to defend Calgary's icon and criticized Gunther's reluctance to defend the World Heavyweight Championship. Hart pinned Gunther's hesitance as cowardice, which triggered a fallout brawl between the champion and Zayn. WWE officials ultimately pulled the two apart, and Zayn was left to receive a hug from Hart and a huge applause from the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. As of this recording, it's currently unclear whether Hart's pointed criticism of Gunther will instigate developments in Zayn's vie for the world title. Zayn wore a Calgary Flames jersey of the tragically deceased hockey player Johnny Goudreau during the segment. WWE would later a tribute of Goudreau and his brother Matthew, who were killed by an alleged drunk driver last month. Now, last night's spectacle in Calgary marked Bret Hart's first appearance on WWE programming since his 2022 appearance at Clash at the Castle. Hart notably criticized Gunther's match with Sheamus at the same event. It's unclear whether that criticism played any role in the planning of Monday's segment. Now, a couple more matches were announced for Bad Blood, including that Hell in a Cell match. But the feud between Women's World Champion Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley officially has Bad Blood. On Monday's episode of Raw, it was announced that Morgan will defend her title against Ripley on the October 5th Premium Live event, a rematch from their championship match at SummerSlam when Dominic Mysterio turned on Ripley. Morgan has only defended her title on two other occasions since winning it in May. Later in the broadcast, Morgan's fellow Judgment Day member Finn Balor challenged Damian Priest to a match at the same PLE, which Priest accepted. Ripley and Priest defeated Morgan and Dominic Mysterio at WWE Bash in Berlin. After Priest agreed to the match, the rest of the Judgment Day stormed the ring and laid out their former member. Ripley came hobbling down to the ramp using a crutch after suffering a recent injury. Of course, this was in kayfabe. Before she could make it to the ring, Morgan came running up behind her, but Ripley was expecting it and shoved the top of the crutch into Morgan's gut. Mysterio attempted to stop her and got slapped in the face and hit with a crutch for his own trouble, but the distraction allowed for Morgan to take up Ripley's injured leg. Ripley made it into the ring where Morgan followed her and beat her with her own crutch. As the Judgment Day continued the beatdown of both Ripley and Priest. Jay Uso ran out to make the save. Last week, of course, Uso and Priest teamed up against Finn Balor and his fellow World Tag Team Champion JD McDonough. Shortly after the in-ring beatdown, it was announced that Ripley had been sent to a local medical facility. But both matches have been confirmed for bad blood. Now, Natalia is back on WWE television. Natalia made her return to Raw on the same night as her uncle Brett did, wrestling and winning her first match since June as her hometown of Calgary went wild. The Queen of Hearts surprised the Pure Fusion Collective when she was the mystery partner for Zelina Vega and Lyra Valkyria, a development that had been reported earlier on in the day. Last week, Shayna Baszler defeated Vega in singles action, after which Zoe Stark and Sonya Deville attacked Vega until Valkyria ran down for the assist. The post-match angle was 
was used to set up this week's six-woman tag team match, which ended with Stark in the sharpshooter. Her partners attempted to make the save when they found themselves in sharpshooters and submissions of their own. Stark ultimately tapped to Natalia. Backstage, Natalia was seen with Bret Hart, who congratulated her on her return and victory. Now, prior to Monday night, Natalia's most recent Raw match took place in June when she wrestled in a loss to Kiana James in James's Raw debut. Natalia would wrestle Izzy Dame on NXT the next day, her last match for Monday's return. Now, ironically, earlier on on Monday, it was reported that James had been removed from the internal roster. It's been speculated she could be dealing with an injury. Natalia reportedly re-signed a new multi-year deal with WWE back in July. She's one of the longest tenured stars in the company, having been signed in 2007 and debuting the following year in 2008. Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill are still the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. They successfully defended their Women's Tag Team Championships against Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, the unholy union on the season premiere of Raw. Fire and Dawn won their opportunity for a rematch at the Tag Team titles after defeating Damage Control's Io Sky and Kairi Sane in a number one contenders match last week. The unholy union first won the bouts at Clash at the Castle in their native Scotland, defeating Zoe Stark and Shayna Baszler and Cargill and Belair in a triple threat tag team match. But Cargill and Belair won the titles back at Bash in Berlin at the end of August. Fire and Belair started off the match, but all the women were quickly on the uh, in the ring with the champions double teaming the Unholy Union. Cargill delivered a big slam to both Fire and Dawn and hit a big elbow in the corner to Fire, but Dawn moved out the way in the opposite corner and gained control of the match. Cargill was able to tag in Belair after she kicked out of a pit attempt and Belair hit a double cross body, then a moonsault off the ropes to Dawn. Belair went to hit a suplex from the middle rope to fire, but Dawn interfered, and the Unholy Union delivered a double-team powerbomb to the EST. Cargill saved Belair from the combo suplex and went for the jaded to Dawn, but was caught with a super kick from fire. The Unholy Union hit a gory bomb face buster to Belair, but Cargill made the save once again. Belair and Cargill hit a DDT-assisted German suplex combination they've been using as their finisher to get the victory and retain the titles. They did also, though, have a confrontation with damage control after the match, possibly setting up a future tag team title bout between the four. The Wyatt Six opened Raw last night with a big victory over American Maid. As I mentioned, this was the opening match of the season premiere episode. Nikki Cross, Dexter Loomis, Joe Gacy and Eric Rowan faced off against Chad Gable, Julius and Brutus Creed and Ivy Nile as Uncle Howdy sat at ringside. Cross started the match by jumping Nile, and all competitors spilled outside of the ring in quick fashion. Cross was the first to find a weapon, putting a garbage can around Nile and striking it over the head uh, with a kendo stick before sending Nile into the ring barricade. The early portion of the match was entirely controlled by the Wyatt Six until Rowan went under the ring to find a table, and Nile spread a fire extinguisher in his face. Rowan was double teamed by the Creed brothers through the table and American Maid was back in control. The Creeds attempted to get Gacy through the table in the ring, but Rowan rose up from the debris on the outside and took a piece of the ring barricade to the men of American Maid. After some more brawling from both teams, Gacy got Gable onto the table in the ring and attempted to go from the top rope, but Gable scurried after him. Gable hit an angle slam to Gacy through the table, but Gacy kicked out of the pin attempt. Gable went for an ankle lock and Nile came in with a kendo stick to assist, but Cross pulled her out of the ring and hit a German suplex to Gable. Following a stare down between Gable and Howdy at ringside, Gable was taken out by Rowan and slammed into the ring steps. Rowan carried Gable into the ring where Howdy met him with a sister Abigail. Loomis hit a splash with an assist from Rowan and pinned Gable for the victory. Now, I brought you the story yesterday about these rumors about possibly AEW Shockwave or an AEW show being part of a Fox AEW broadcast agreement. Now, AEW star Roosh is adding fuel to the flames of a rumor that emerged on Monday that the company could possibly be signing a TV deal with Fox. In addition to Warner Bros. Discovery, it's possible they could have a deal with both Fox and WBD. Monday night, Roosh posted a photo of himself posing beneath a Fox Sports logo on his X account, which you can see on the screen right there. Now, fans commented below the post joking that Roosh was the one to get the deal done. Now, AEW president Tony Khan has teased that a new media rights deal between AEW and Warner Bros. Discovery is imminent, but recently confirmed that he has not put pen to paper. AEW recently trademarked the name AEW Shockwave, which has fans wondering if the company is looking to fill the time slot that SmackDown once held on Fox. Fightful Select reported that sources said AEW has been in talks with the company. Fox refused to comment officially to the outlet 
outlets. Per the report, Fox liked the ad revenue SmackDown brought in on Friday nights, but it was too expensive for the network and a cheaper wrestling property was enticing. As of this recording, there is no official word on whether a deal between AEW and Fox is possible or if it's going to happen. And finally, reactions are still filing in when it comes to the Vince McMahon upcoming Netflix docuseries. Now, the Vince McMahon Netflix docuseries is dropping on the streaming platform just before the WWE Netflix era begins. WrestleNomics posted that the final episode of the series will cover McMahon's lawsuits alleging a number of sexual misconduct claims, and it would also be addressed at the top of the show. WWE sources that Fightful Select spoke to believe that this was to establish, to help take heat off any of the talking heads on the show that may have spoken about McMahon in glowing terms before the 2022 allegations emerge. Quote, I don't think at this point anyone should care about the life and times of Vince McMahon above the legal situation he's in, said one WWE talent over of over a decade. Of everyone that Fightful spoke to in WWE, over one dozen contacts in this particular story, allegedly, across talent, staff and higher ups, it was a unanimous feeling of wanting to wash their hands of Vince McMahon. Whether or not Fightful spoke to or didn't speak to is of another question. Now, Fightful say they did reach out to Janelle Grant's spokesperson about her inclusion or lack thereof and were told, quote, Netflix's documentary group made the initial outreach to Janelle's representation for an interview for this project. Despite this, no such interview came to fruition, a spokesperson for Janelle Grant said. Now, Fightful had asked for more detail on the phrasing of the interview not coming to fruition as well, specifically if there was ever a follow-up from Netflix after the initial outreach. Fightful say they didn't get any further the explanation. Those in WWE that spoke on the trailer said they believe the opening line from McMahon not being a bad guy was designed to increase chatter about the upcoming docuseries. WWE has yet to comment in an official capacity on the docuseries trailer. But there you go, guys. The latest pro wrestling news for you. Be sure to smash the like on the like button. Be sure to subscribe bottom right hand corner. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and I'll speak for you again very, very soon. Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.